started. Hello and welcome to Phoenixville Library. I'm Mark Pinto and I would like to welcome Michelle Evans from Phoenixville Hospital who's with us tonight to talk about vaping and what every parent should be concerned uh, about uh, nicotine addiction. So uh, Michelle, welcome and take it away. Thank you. I'll do a brief introduction on myself and then I, if you don't mind, I ask the crowd like, what relation to if you have a child or a grandchild or anything like that or you're just here to learn. Um, so like, I said, like Mark said, my name is Michelle Evans. I'm a nurse at Phoenixville Hospital. I've been there for many, many years, probably 30 plus. Um, probably the most last 15 years I've been in community, community health and I love it love it love it I get to go out into the community spend time with people and then we go out frequently to different outreach sites and then I got into the tobacco I took over for someone who was heading up the tobacco uh, department at the hospital who had retired and now I'm loving that too um, so I'll be at the community and I'll see someone in the dollar store and they'll be like, you helped me quit smoking. So it's good to hear that. Um, with the vaping comes another challenge. So I've been put, being pulled into different school districts too. Um, so that's why I thought it would be good if I offer something for parents to know what it's all about. Some parents don't even know their child's doing it. I might give you an idea and a visual of what different things look like um, and then ask questions. And there's always the school that you can ask questions for help too because they reach out to me and I would come in and do presentations. Um, so that's the gist of me. Um, do I, the one online, are you a parent of anyone vaping or just concerned parent? A, a step parent of one who's, who was vaping, but I want to see if I can learn more for signs in case he starts again. Okay. All right. Um, do you mind if I ask what grade? 10th grade. Okay. All right. 10th grade. I've been in the middle and the high school for the, those students that actively get caught, but I've been trying to get into the elementary school health classes to give presentations to. So that's my goal, to get them when they're younger before they get to that point. Um, how about anyone here? Parent, grandparent of anyone vaping or just interested? I'm a parent of somebody who uses medical marijuana and they use it. As a vape. Yeah. Okay. And also there, were, uh, there have been people that have asked me personally, would you, what do you think about my child vaping to avoid smoking? And it's like, absolutely not. And I just need, I just would like to see all the information, what it actually does to you, mm -hmm. and just everything involved okay. with it, so right. I can help people. And I already spoke with you, uh, just a concerned citizen, right? Well, my background is in health and um, nutrition. I got a beautiful book that Mark got, Breaking Through Depression, and they address they address how sleep patterns, um, eating habits, uh, hydration, all of that, can, and also the use of computers can just trigger things. I work at the local nursing home, and we have adult workers who are vaping, mm -hmm. and um, I just don't think it's good. Yeah. Okay. I'll start this. I kind of kept it mostly generic um, because I would then I open it for questions if you want more detailed things. I, I didn't want to put too much details up there, but um, let me see if I can advance. So this is just have a teen struggling with vaping. Um, uh -oh. yeah, there we go. All right, so what are e-cigarettes? What are they called? I start this because so many of the students call things different names. So you might hear a name and you, you won't have any idea what it is. So the original was e-cig, there's vape, there's vape pens they're called, um, personal vaporizer, or is it PV? Of course, there's abbreviations for everything. Mod Jules is the big, the name brand one. That might be the one that everyone heard of first. They're the first ones that really got kick-started with all of you being involved in vaping. Um, vape pipe, there's hookah sticks as well. Um, so what is it? It's a rechargeable battery. The cartridge holds this e-liquid juice next to it. It gets heat, the battery heats this liquid up at such high levels that it emits this vapor then. I do have pictures coming up, but um, this is just generic then. This, the atomizer is what that battery is called, the steam creating it. Um, and then it puts the e-juice into a vapor, into the aerosol. So you are inhaling this aerosol into your lungs. Um, the one thing I always ask students, 
because they're asking, what if I just vape flavors and no nicotine? Is that good for you? And my answer is, there's only one good thing, one healthy thing that's supposed to go into your lungs. And what is that? Air. Air, right? <laughs> so if it's not air, then it's not good to be inhaled. Um, and they have to think about that for a while. Um, so this is what the original one looks like. So you can see the mouthpiece here. Um, this is the heater. The liquid goes in that clear thing around that little heater. And then this is the battery. So the battery charges up the heater, which heats up the liquid at very, very high levels, higher levels than a co traditional combustible cigarette. And then you inhale, and then you puff out, and you get, with um, e-cigarettes, you get big clouds. I don't know if you ever noticed anyone walking with this big vapor cloud over their head or in a car. It really, like, engulfs the hood of the car. So, And that's the, the eye-catching thing for the students, too, is they see all that. Um, here is the, the evolution of, we'll do it all at once, the evolution. So the first generation looks typically like cigarettes, right? That's when they were trying to trick the adults into it. What happened with that is the percentage of American adults smoking was decreasing. We used to be like 28%, 24%. It was going down to 14, 15. So the tobacco companies were freaking out. They're like, oh no, what are we gonna do? So they claim they created these e-cigarettes to help adults quit smoking. But they made all these e-cigarettes and flavors. So who do you think they were attracting then? Because I don't know many adults that would want creme brulee, cookies and cream, Fruit Loop flavor juices, right? <laughs> that's true, it's, there's a Fruit Loop. Um, so that's how they're like, oh, we'll catch them when they're younger now, get them addicted to this, then maybe they'll transition to the traditional cigarettes. So that's the thought process. The tobacco companies have excellent, excellent marketing or marketers, and they're just geniuses. They're like two steps ahead of us at all times. So the, as you see, like I said, it looks traditionally like a cigarette, it's slim. Then we got into the second ones that look more like a pen. Those were pre-filled, so you can fill up the cartridge. When you finish, you take another flavor juice and you put it in. Um, the problem here was a lot of the students are filling it with things they shouldn't be filling it with as well. So they're adding THC, CBD, and all that stuff to it. So they have more access to what they can put in it. Um, then they went to the third generation. They look like mods and tanks. They look really big and bulky. These are the ones that create those big, huge plumes of aerosol. Those are the ones. Um, then they got a little sleeker. Um, this, this is the Jewel. That's where it really took off. That was around 2011, 2012. All starts in the UK and comes back to us. So the, see how small that is? It's sleek and it looks like a USB port, right? Flash drive for a computer. So mm -hmm. students were putting it into the computers to charge them up during school. The teachers, none the wiser to it. Um, then um, they got to different funky shapes here too, you can see. This, this thing is called a sorn. It looks like a little teardrop. It fits right in the palm of your hand, so it's easy to hide. It's very discreet. And these other ones are like something called smock and things like that. So they're getting more creative. They're getting smaller, as you can see. Um, easier to hide. Um, and refillable. I'm sorry, I keep pointing it. <laughs> so here's just a generic thing. So I go out typically to schools. Every two years, we go out to the high school, or any school, middle high schools usually, um, and do what's a tobacco youth survey. Um, and the state picks random schools, random classrooms, so we don't really know who we're going to. Um, and we, they take like a 99 question survey about all the tobacco related stuff. And it actually ventures into all kinds of anything household so it can ask about alcohol it can ask about if there's guns in the house it can ask you know are you eating healthy food or are you exercising so this is the I don't have so we did 2018 um, we had did 2022 but I don't have any slides on that yet they have they did a report but it's written but they haven't created these nice infographics yet but um so you can see look at the age so you have 65 plus is like 0.8 we're smoking percent then you go up to 45 to 66, 2.1, 25 to 44, then you bump up a little bit. But then look at the young, 18 to 24, 7.6. So going back to what I said when the tobacco company said they did this for adults, 
do you see that reflected in these results then? No, it's the, the young ones that are doing it. So they play dumb. <laughs> um, this is one I try to explain to the students as well, and I even explain it to my um, adults that are helping to actually quit. So nicotine on the brain. In order to describe what's going on, I tell people everyone has receptors in their brain. I tell them to think of them like little Pac-Man. You know the Pac-Man game? Gobbles up things. So what happens is you have receptors. That they're called acetylcholine. Every person has those receptors. What happens is the nicotine mimics the acetylcholine receptors. So your brain now thinks that's normal to have and want nicotine in the, on the brain, in the brain. It tricks them. It mimics it. So what happens is when you inhale, whether it's a vape or a traditional cigarette, the nicotine travels from your mouth, gets into the bloodstream, up to your brain, and that receptor says, feed me, feed me, because it now thinks it's nicotine. So it gobbles up the nicotine. What happens at that moment is everyone's aha moment, where that's the feel-good moment, because hormones are being released, and there's feel-good hormones, and these are dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. <coughs> dopamine is the master hormone of addiction. Same hormone that's released when you do any kind of drugs, heroin, crack, cocaine, anything like alcohol. That's the feel-good hormone, dopamine. So your brain says, oh, that's right, I feel good. It associates that smoking or vaping experience with that feel-good moment. So everything's hunky-dory because the hormones are at high levels. After a few moments, the hormone levels dip a little bit. Your brain says, uh-oh, I want to feel that way again. So what do you do? You pick up again and you get another peak of these hormones. Then you get a little dip, and a little peak, and a little dip. It's that initiation of that cycle which triggers the physical addiction part of it all. Okay, so typically I tell people three to four days without feeding that nicotine receptor, nicotine, the physical addiction part actually goes away. It's more of the mental and then the social. Those are the two that are difficult to struggle. So I tell people, think about this. So you have a house plant. You forget to water for three to four days. Those, they're gonna droop, right? Those plants are gonna droop. The leaves will start drooping. So that's sort of what we want you to imagine happening to your nicotine receptors. They're gonna droop, they're gonna stop spitting out those hormones, triggering you to want more and more. Then you rely on the behavioral stuff and then the social stuff. Um, now the behavioral addiction, I believe, is the toughest for everyone, and that's usually what gets people to come back to smoking or vaping. Um, it's just the automatic, the routine. Like wake first, wake up in the morning, you have to have a hit before the feet even hit the ground. After a meal, with students, they do it before school. They do it during while they're walking in the halls from one classroom to another. They do it in the bathrooms. And then they're watching the clock to see when the next time they can have another hit, whether it's, you know, walking home or vice, you know, whatever. Um, so that's the problem with the youth right now is it's avoiding, like, it's interrupting their concentration in school. They're counting the ticks in the clock until they can get somewhere. And that's where they get in trouble then because they're like, they feel a little confident and they have a little slip in the hallway and then they get caught. Most bathrooms and schools have vape detectors now, so if they feel that feel that aerosol, it's supposed to go off, it's supposed to trigger someone, whoever has the master, uh, I don't know, base <laughs> of all that, and then they go and stand outside the bathroom and ask people when they come out if they've been vaping. So. Um, so that's the physical, I mean that's the behavioral part. Now the social part is typically what gets them started to begin with. Um, peer pressure, basically, for the vaping with the youth, what happens is eventually they see someone vaping, they might say, hey, can I have a hit? And then they're good for a while. Then they'll go, they'll be around someone else, hey, can I have a hit? So it goes from experimenting, then it goes to I'm gonna just purchase my own and I'm gonna have my own. And then it becomes I can't go without it. I can't go 15 minutes without it. Now I have an adult in my, seat, in my smoking class now who was smoking, went to vaping to get off the smokes, Still doing about two or three cigarettes, but no one can quantify, even adult or child, when I say, how frequently are you using the vape? They're like, I don't know, it's all the time. It's so convenient, it's here, I can grab it. So it's very hard for them to quantify the amount that they're using. So it's a little difficult for me um, when I say, this is how much nicotine you're probably getting, because they can't give me a definite answer. 
Unlike a traditional cigarette, there's a beginning and an end to it. Unlike a vape, it's never ending, really. You keep refilling, you can throw it out and get a new one. So, and then in school, they, the kids share, too. So it's very hard to quantify <coughs> the amount of nicotine they're getting. Um, so that's one thing with that, with the social part. Now, as adults who vape or even smoke, it kind of trips them up. Let's say you quit for, I don't know, three weeks or something. You're around someone who's smoking or vaping, and you're like, I can just do it this once. And then you do it, and then those hormones are kicking in again, telling you, oh, you feel good, keep going, and then you're stuck back to doing it. So it's the physical, it's the mental, and the social, which makes this quitting any kind of nicotine very difficult for everybody. Um, there's no right or wrong equation to say, do this, do this, you'll definitely quit. It's all trial and error. Everyone's a little different. You just got to do a lot of these behavioral modification things. So that's my spiel about brains. <laughs> Um, now this one is body. Obviously, you know, this is just a generic slide on, um, oops, sorry. So basically, trouble breathing damages to lung. That's what the first thing everyone thinks of. But, you know, it also causes heart problems. So the very first thing people say to me when I ask, why do you choose to smoke or vape? Why do you need nicotine? Well, it helps me with my stress when I'm anxious. So in actuality, it is causing more internal stress in your body. But you're associating that feel-good hormone as a relaxation process. But it causes something called fight or flight, which causes everything to move faster in your brain because you're like working off adrenaline, and that's what's going on internally. So it's very hard to understand why they feel this sense of relief other than that release of those hormones. Um, it causes stomach problems as well. It go, and then it can cause uh, reproductive. It's like head to toe. There's, but these are usually the basics of what people tell me about. Um, all right. Why is nicotine so dangerous? I just threw a couple things there. Um, it's addictive, right? And the problem is I don't feel the youth right now feel that it is addictive. They tell me many times when they come to the class after being caught in school, I have like a survey for them to fill out to say how addictive you are to it. I'm not addicted. I can stop any time. And I'm like, okay, but you're still doing it. You're getting in trouble. Your parents took your phone away. You're grounded. You have to come here. You're going to get suspended. So are you truly not addicted? They're, it's, that, it, it's that age. They know everything, you know. They are not addicted at all. Um, it's exposure to harmful chemicals. So a traditional cigarette has around 7,000 chemicals in it, believe it or not. Yes. Um, I have a display that I take to health fairs with a big cigarette that has like everything in it. Like rat poisoning, it's their stuff, cyanide, yes. Uh, nail polish remover, car exhaust, all that stuff is in a cigarette. <laughs> How they get away with it is because it's in small amounts. So it, it, it doesn't raise red flags. Yes, there are chemicals in vapes as well. Um, not near 7,000, but enough to cause harm. And they are still doing so much um, research on, on that. It's, it's like an ever-evolving research on it. They don't know. And what happens is you have, there are, can there are cancer-causing chemicals in vapes as well. Um, what happens is it gets heated, the liquid gets heated up at such high levels, it causes different chemical reactions with each other. So you might have two or three chemicals there, then they it gets heat up to such high levels, it has a chemical reaction and causes other rea uh, chemicals to release. I do have a slide on all the chemicals, or most of the chemicals that are in it. Um, impulse control, so it affects your impulse control, especially at a young age. Their brains are like sponges, so they can learn like a new trick very easily. They can learn how to pick up a new um, instrument without a problem. They can pick up a new language because their brains are like sponges. So they get addicted harder and faster than adults do. It takes adults a little longer to learn things, right? Like you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but their brains under the age of 21 are like sponges, so they'll pick up this addiction a lot faster than an adult will. Um, this is what I hear a lot in school, concentration and learning ability. So they get lack of concentration, doesn't, and like the brain doesn't fully develop to the mid-20s, the 21 is usually the age, so there was some legislative there to push the age of buying anything nicotine-wise to 21. It did pass about 
uh, pre-COVID, what is that now? Four years? Three years? Three years. Three, four, three years? Three, four, around there. So they passed it. It's called the Tobacco 21 Law. So their thinking is if you can't purchase till the age of 21, then the, the younger kids will have less likely to be able to have access to um, to vapes or nicotine because typically they have older siblings. So when you're in high school, you're not 21 yet. So that's their thinking, but they find ways to get around everything. And we still have stores that that sell underage. So we have a constant people going around and trying to send some youth in there to trick stores to see if they will purchase. So that is an ongoing thing. <coughs> but that's the thinking behind the 21, your brain being not fully developed. Um, cravings, you go out of the way to find nicotine, so again, you get in trouble, you steal from older siblings, I've heard that a lot, feeling anxious or irritable if you can't use. So again, going back to the mental health, they feel that it's helping them, but and then they get more anxious to the next time they can use. I think I already went out, see, I just go on a <laughs> on the spurt, but um, teen brains are wired to learn new things quickly. Addiction is a learning process that happens in the brain, it's a rewiring. Um, and they can get addicted faster, longer, and harder. Another way I can explain the whole addiction thing, how the uh, nicotine takes over, is I try to tell adults to think of this. You have a house built out of wood, right? Pre-established building. What happens is then nicotine, I mean nicotine, I'm sorry, um, termites come in and alter your building, your wood, therefore making it their own. And that's what the nicotine is doing with our brains. It takes over our brain, thinks it's their own, and then your brain reacts to that. Um, again, nicotine on the brain. <sighs> Addiction cycle. So um, let me just do it all at once here. Wow. These are all some of the slides. So it starts, nicotine is absorbed. So this is basically like the trial and error phase again, the experimental. You try it once in a while, you might try it from a friend, blah, 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 blah. Dopamine re is released when it hits those receptors. That's that feel good moment. So then these youth are saying, hey, I liked how that feel. They term it as a good buzz, is what they say. It's a buzz. Um, then motivation to repeat. So you keep trying, you keep bumming off someone. Then you build up a tolerance. So you need more and more nicotine to get that release again. Um, that's when you're purchasing their own now. They're hiding it from parents and schools. Then you have to get more, more increased dose, like I said. They don't have any idea what, how, many, how much they're using. I don't know, 14 times while I'm at school, you know, so no real idea. And then craving and withdrawal symptoms. So what happens is, let's say they get caught. Let's say the parents confiscate it. Let's say the school confiscates it. They don't have an active way of getting another one right away. They start feeling these cravings and this withdrawal symptoms, so then they associate that with depression. I need it again, you know. So then they go back. That's the whole vicious cycle. Now the craving and the withdrawal symptoms, they usually last about 72 hours. The irritability is one of the last withdrawal effects to go away. So add that irritability on top of a normal teenager, you got a monster, right? <laughs> so that's usually the, and I tell them this too. I give them scenarios like, Jimmy went out to a party and tried the bait for the first time. Is that use? Is that misuse? Is that addiction? And then they have to think and tell me about it. So they kind of understand the process of the whole addiction. Not that they're addicted, they say, but they understand. <laughs> um, again, liquid nicotine, that's, that was the new ray. That's what created these e-cigarettes. Again, very toxic, harmful. Um, since e-cigarettes came on the market, the rise to uh, calls to the poison control have increased. Um, see how tiny some of them are, the liquids? So, and if they smell good, they look like they're orange. They smell like uh, you know, peaches and cream or something. You have young toddlers or pets around. They get a hold of that, that can give them nicotine toxicity and send them to the hospital. So I tell them, if you have this stuff around, please keep it away from any of your young siblings or even your pets because it is very dangerous. Um, again, other side effects, dizziness, elevated blood pressure, heat, rapid heartbeat, nausea, confusion, possible seizures with overexposure to the nicotine and skin irritation. They can even burn. Like, um, probably about five years ago, there was a couple reports of the battery blowing up in someone's car because it heated so bad. So, there's a lot of dangers. But this, 
the calls to the poison control, I really try to hit home, and even with adults that are doing it. Typically, if I have any of the, the, the middle school or high schoolers come in, I usually ask, do you have parents at home that smoke or vape? And then they'll tell me, and then I'm like, okay, I know that's difficult for you, but, you know, please watch for this. Don't lay your this vapes around. You know, they hide them in their book bags. A, a pet will get in there. It smells, like, this stuff really smells good. Some of it cotton candy flavored. So it is very dangerous. A little body like this, if they drank that, they would be rushed to the ER. Um, this is another aspect of the vape which makes it so likable to adults and youth. Um, it's something called nicotine salts. So a traditional cigarette, you inhale the nicotine. It's very harsh, burny when it goes into the lungs. Um, that's why I don't understand why they, they people complain that, oh, it burns my throat, but it's the addiction that keeps it going, them going. Now they were smart, so they did something called nicotine salts. What it does is it adds a chemical, like an acid, benzoic acid, to this liquid nicotine. And what it does is it makes it a smoother experience. Um, so you, if it's nice and smooth and not burning like a traditional combustible cigarette, you tend to breathe in more frequently, deeper, um, and that's why they're getting a lot more nicotine with the vapes. It's a more convenient, smoother, enjoyable experience experience as opposed to a traditional cigarette because I'll ask the young ones when they come in does anyone smoke regular cigarettes oh, no they're gross they say so it's this is the reason it's nicotine salts makes it nice and smooth um, so what's in a vaping device so these are the generic basically every vape has this so you have or organic volatile compounds so again you're going into like the rat poisoning the fingernail polish whole bunch of of chemicals that way. Cancerous chemicals, you have heavy metals such as nickel, tin, and lead, believe it or not. So you're inhaling that when you're inhaling the nicotine. Um, and a lot of that comes from the outer line, the coating of the vape device. A lot of it's metal, tin, nickel, that heats up. So you're also, that's, it's, it's also being emitted out as second hand smoke as well. Um, flavorings, this is everyone's favorite. Something called diacetyl, big word. Um, it's a chemical linked to lung disease. It's called bronchiolitis, but this is what happens. So they discovered um, people working in popcorn factories. Diacetyl was like the flavoring that they would add on in microwave popcorn. Um, they discovered that a lot of the coworkers were, wait, were having lung issues and they found it was related to this flavoring. So this flavoring is FDA proof for food. With food, you digest it goes to your stomach, right? Gets rid of it. You can't digest flavors in your lungs. So it's not FDA approved for your lungs, but it's FDA approved for flavor, I mean for food. That's the part I kind of bring home with the kids. Like, oh, it's just flavoring, but it's not meant, you're not meant to smoke that flavor and inhale it. So, um, and then nicotine. I would say 99.9% .9 of vapes all vapes have nicotine, whether it's marked there or not. Very few do not have nicotine. And when I ask, even adults, but mostly when I ask youth, okay, you're vaping, does it have nicotine in it? I don't know. A lot of them don't even know what brand they're vaping. So that's a problem, the nicotine. Now the problem, I can go back a step further with adults when we were saying Vapes were made to push adults to quit, you know, move from the cigarettes to the vapes. What happens is the adult sticks, doesn't give up this, the regular traditional cigarettes. So they're still smoking a couple cigarettes on top of the vape. So now they're getting double the amount of nicotine they would if they just smoked one. It's called dual using. So, and that's kind of what the tobacco companies were hoping, you know, with the kids. They'll start vaping, then they might experiment more with traditional cigarettes. And that doing this also opens a door for other addictions as well. If you're prone to do this, they are tend to be more experimental with other drugs. That looks an odd color. Oh, now I messed up something, didn't I? There we go. All right, I don't know why that's so pale, but these are a big list of the traditional withdrawal symptoms. For youth, we call them recovery because if we want them to think that your brain's in the process of recovering from the addiction. 
and the need for nicotine. So we call it recovery symptoms to make it a little positive spin on it. But you can see there's the feel, uh, irritability, crankiness, trouble sleeping, tired, uh, headaches, stomach aches, increased appetite, nausea, dry mouth, weight gain, anxiety, coughing, feeling lightheaded, and trouble concentrating. Doesn't that sound like a wonderful combination of everything? Um, so again, with youth, it's hard to tell because they're always, you know, irritable at times. They have anxiety related to school-based things, sports things. So it's hard to catch these symptoms, but you gotta look for the combination. Like, are they more sneaky? Um, are they hiding things? Do you smell like a fresh kind of, uh, you know, sugary flavor, butter, you know, butter, or like I said, cotton can't, all kind of great. That kind of stays around a little longer, a little bit after doing it in their bedrooms or in a room. You can smell it as you walk through. You're like, that smells real sweet. So, um, those are all signs. Um, dry mouth, respiratory problems is a big sign too. Um, they start noticing it. A lot of breathing problems if they're uh, athletes. I had one gentleman tell a young gentleman say. I have to quit because I can't play basketball. I can't run up and down the court as well as I could before. So that could be a sign. If you see them saying, uh, you know, huffing and puffing more or getting more tired during sports where they normally weren't, those are all things that kind of open you up for, you know, questions. I try to tell the youth, I'm like, do you feel comfortable speaking to your parents about having this problem? And if they don't, I'm like, how about anyone in a school? Can you go to the school nurse? So I'm like, you can call me if you know, and I can help talk to you and then we can reach out to a parent or something like that. So most of them will not talk to anyone in the school because they feel they're gonna get in trouble in the school. They wanna be known as a vapor then, you know. But it's just trying to keep the line of communications open. Why is it not going anywhere? Oh, see, I forgot I did all this. Those are just more bold prints. But, you know, um, doctors are starting to ask more frequently um, when they go in. They typically were asking, do you smoke? And a kid will say, no, I don't smoke. But they're vaping. They don't associate smoking and vaping. So now they're, the doctors, the pediatricians are picking up on that. So they are starting to ask, do you vape? Then they would answer. And I tell them when I see them anytime, if I'm going to the middle school, high school, or elementary, if you're at a doctor, please tell them. If you're in for a sick visit or anything, tell them, I do vape. So they, it might help trigger them to figure out what's going on with you. So don't hide it with your doctor because it could help you down the road. They might guide treatment differently. Here's another picture. I like to put pictures up there, especially for the parents. So if you see anything, um, again, the jewel, like I said, was the first generation of disposables that took was a hot rave. So those little bottles there, those little rectangles of, they're equivalent to one pack of cigarettes. Kids were doing two and three in a day. The smock, like I said, got a little bulkier. Um, still, these were disposable, or I'm sorry, re re refillable. The Soren, and then these puff bars are the rave. This is one of the newest things they were doing. These are throw away. So, one way, I have down a couple slides, all the legislative about it, but probably a year ago, um, they went, the FDA ruled against adding flavors to the, like the Juul. So the Juul's only allowed to have three flavors now, mint, because cigarettes are in mint, and then one's tobacco and one's Virginia tobacco. So those are only flavors they're allowed to have now because of this regulation. Um, and now these, because they're disposable, they are outside the limits of that ruling. See, again, tobacco companies two steps ahead of legislation. So these are what the kids are really doing now. Tons of flavors, cheaper than the other ones. I think you can get a pack, two pack for $14 of these. So that's the rate now, puff bars. Um, I always ask these kids, um, how do you get these? Now, I don't know if they're telling me truthfully or not, but um, what do you think out of those choices? Huh? Originally, but nope. Social. So, again, friends, older siblings, friends, older brothers, sisters. Um, 
This is something I put in there because it's something new and upcoming as well. Um, it's not quite a vape, but what it is is you put a traditional cigarette in it, and this this little it's called IQOS heats it up. So it's not tip, you're not burning a cigarette. It's a heatable tobacco. I just throw that in there just to let parents know that that's existing as well. Again, clever. Here's another one. I haven't heard my any of the youth doing this. Um, adults are starting to do it. Um, this is oral nicotine pouches. So there's no tobacco in this, just pure nicotine. So a lot of my adults are using that similar to like um, a nicotine lozenger or gum or anything. But this reminds them of what's called snus. Have you ever heard of that? It's like a chewing tobacco. They put it in a packet like that. Um, but this is just pure nicotine. So again, it's not regulated by any of the tobacco leg legislation. These amounts can go up to, there's four milligrams per pouch, there's six and eight, and they're trying to fight for a 12 milligram pouch at the moment. So just in case you see these little things around, they're just pure nicotine. Here, this is a good one. <laughs> Hiding in plain sight. I try to make you. I have one more. Yeah. So you can see the top thing. They, they make vapeware. So it's um, sweatshirts. See the strings? That's actually the thing for the vape for them to be walking, and you can just discreetly suck on your vape. Um, key pod. So your key in your car. That's actually a vape in there. Same thing with a smartwatch. You attach that. It's a vape. You can inhale on that. A regular inhaler. <laughs> And backpacks, so they put the backpacks on, it's right here on the strap, so they can just hit like that. Again, vaping companies, tobacco companies, very smart, very good marketing people, which makes this the trouble with in school, with adults and stuff like that. Um, you can go on YouTube and you can see all kinds of things. They can order this stuff online. Um, someone even made their own, um, so they took a highlighter they hollowed out the highlighter, they put the vape in that, so it looks like they just have a highlighter. Very smart, right? <laughs> All right. This is just a little statistics thing that I like to put in there. High school students who are currently smoking, this was in the 2019 one, about 5.8%. So typically, on average, right now, as the new uh, tobacco surveys are coming in, they're saying it's 1 in 10 middle school and high schoolers, but I had students in high school and I still I'm still a proponent of the one in five um, high school males higher than the young uh, than, than the female um, but the kids under 18 who try smoking for the first time each day so there's that's a pretty big number too which is that link between trying vapes and then trying cigarettes um, and then the secondhand smoke, they do not believe that any kind of vape is causing secondhand smoke. That's cigarettes, they say, but it is still causing secondhand smoke. You can affect pets and other, you know, family members. Um, so 2018, there was about 13.7% um, smoking, about 15.6 men, and then 12 women is what they say on average. But I, like I said, I would still say so 13.7 adults in 2018 is down from, like I said, a couple years back, it was high as 28, 24, and then it dipped into 14. So that's a pretty good number. I don't really see a lot of adults, none of them that come to me for help. They're, I think, on one handful of people that were vaping, so most of them were still doing cigarettes. So my population that comes see me might not be in that demographic, but here again, you can see how the, the blue is the cigarettes, how it went down, right? And then e-cigarettes came up around 2008, 2010 is when they really, that jewel hit. So you can see how it's creeping up and up and up. Um, here's the only slide I could find from 2022 so far. Like I said, they're starting to come out. So they say 2.5 million middle and high schoolers. They say one in four. I believe that one more than that other previous one. Most of them are disposables. Why? Because they're not regulated, so they have lots and lots of flavors. There's thousands of different flavors, honestly, there is. Um, that's about 85% use the flavored e-cigarettes of all electronic devices. Um, 
Again, here's another one, basically saying the same thing. The one million use multiple tobacco products, so cigarettes and vapes, and then that, that's, that little circular thing is the snus, snus, sorry. Yes, go ahead. When the children come into school with this on their person, uh, is there a way that they could create a monitor that would scan it? When I was growing up, there was issues with children coming into schools with guns and knives. And they had dogs that could I would, sniff it, you know, and I'm not saying to get that yeah, radical, right. but is there a way to scan it? To you know, if like if on, someone goes in, I, it's, they're making them more <laughs> plastic now too, uh, so they do have a testing device when someone gets caught, they put a little bit of liquid in there and they can tell if it has THC in it. It, it's more of a waxy, becomes a waxy substance, so they know it's THC then. So they do have a kit for that, and then that's when they have to call the authorities in for that. But um, the vape detectors, they go by aerosol. So technically, you okay. could go in their bathroom and spray hairspray, and it would go off. And the kids know that. <laughs> so um, nothing yet to detect that they have the devices on, but when they confiscate the devices, they have a technology to test it for THC. Um, again, here's just a whole list again of any tobacco products um, versus e-cigarettes, cigars. There's little cigars out there too, little mini cigarillos they're called. I don't see many youth doing that. Cigarettes. Um, smokeless tobacco, hookah, is like in a pipe. Mm -hmm. So they're making electronic versions of all that as well. Oh. So this is like a water vapor thing where they put it in and heat it up. And obviously that, they're larger and less easy to hide so but they're out there um, they have hookah bars people go in and just do this stuff uh, here's the one I was telling you about so that was um, raising the age from 18 to 21 hopefully reducing access is what their main goal was um, hopefully keeping vapes out of the school because like I said most seniors aren't 21 yet so they, they need to go elsewhere for products um, this is the one that we are working on now. We have a minimal ban, like I said, on all the disposable stuff, especially like Jewel with the flavors. So there's only those three flavors, generic flavors. But that's why all those puff bars are becoming more popular because they're disposable and they are still allowed. They work their way around it. So the puff bars, the disposables are in legislation now. It just takes so long for things to happen. They give the companies a deadline where they have to try to improve, they have to change the, um, the wording, the verbiage on all their devices, and then they don't abide by that, and they go back to court, and it's another fight. So it takes a while, but that's what's in the process now. Um, nice pictures I like to show a lot of. Elf bars and other disposable too. You can see cotton candy flavored, sugar cookie flavored, pink lemonade, um, what's the other one? Peach, pineapple, blue, blue raspberry is the, the rave. But yeah, see the nice pretty colors, right? When they're supposed to be banning flavors. Is there any way that they can put on the doors when the children come to school? Just like, do not carry a gun in. Well, if, if well there, there are signs for no smoking. I, we've, okay. up, they've changed policies to add e-cigarettes. Now, even all these buildings, too, should be having verbiage on there. No no smoking or no tobacco. Do they have that on, on the high school doors yes. and the grade school? Yes. They should have it also on the buses. Like yeah, that. that's true. Yeah, that would be a good point there, the buses. I don't Possibly. think they it's do it too much on the buses. They wait till as soon as they're out of it, but... Well, I don't think so. So again, one year past the deadline for the FDA to take action on e-cigarettes. Wow. All these flavors are still in the market. Wow. So if you are friendly or not friendly with any of your legislators, you can always bring this up. Hey, what is your take? What is your stand on e um, flavors and e-cigarettes and tobacco? Um, I have to, as part of being a grant recipient doing this for free, um, I have to speak to five local legislators. Mm -hmm. So I always have to go in and give my spiel. <laughs> um, like, 
maintaining master settlement agreement. I don't know if anyone knows what that is. So way back in 2008, they sued, the, the state sued the tobacco companies because, believe it or not, tobacco is dangerous to your health. <laughs> So the state submitted to that, and they have to every year attribute a certain percent of money, funds, to the state, which are supposed to go towards education and prevention for adults and youth. Every year, it's a battle to maintain that same amount of level. It gets less and less. Wow. Um, so that's what the purpose of meeting with the legislators is. So. Oh, interesting. And I just put up a quick information about vaping and school policies. So um, every policy should be updated to include vapes, not just tobacco or smoking. Um, they should offer them some education. They should offer them uh, a way to communicate for assistance to help quit if they're actively or desire to quit. Um, enforcement options. Different schools have different enforcement options. Um, and sticking to the enforcement options is a little bit of a glitch sometimes too, like that goes in with the penalties and then evaluation. So I try to, when I go into the schools, to talk to the students, like if you really truly want to quit, um, speak to the school nurse if you're irritable in school, in class. Mm -hmm. Instead of going and hitting a nicotine with a vape, go talk to the school nurse. Ask her for a piece of hard candy or gum or anything like that. So they all say they're allowed to have gum and candy in classrooms. So I'm like, if, if she supplied that, feel, but none of them at this point feel comfortable going anywhere. Um, but that's the problem, that's the vicious cycle. They get caught and then they can't smoke in school or vape in school anymore. They got all these issues, irritability, then they get in fights and they just don't have anyone to turn to. So I'm trying to enforce that when I go into schools, like talk to the school nurse. Right, so that's the battle. Um, it is a battle. Um, I think that's it. That's just my information if anyone wanted to reach out to me. I can do <coughs> person programs, virtual programs, and then tell, I do tons of telephone counseling for people that work different schedule times. So we just talk on the phone for like 15, 20 minutes to help people quit and vape. Any questions? I know I threw out a lot there. <laughs> oh my gosh, look at that. <laughs> I could have gone on more. So. <laughs> Um, how about anyone online there have a question? Nope, this is very informative. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I probably went overboard, but I try when I get an audience, I try to tell them everything. <laughs> um, but again, always if you have a student a, a, or a grandchild in school, they're around a lot of people that vape. If they're questioning you, don't feel be afraid to tell them the truth that it's not good for you or there's options, go to the school nurse. Um, all the school nurses here around in Phoenixville at least um, have my contact information they can always call me um, I can't <coughs> offer you, anyone under the age of 18 any patches gum or lozenges but I can give recommendations for the parents to speak to the doctor um, because that patch gum and lozenges everyone's afraid of. I don't want them to put anything new in their system but they're already putting the nicotine in their system with the vape or cigarettes, plus extra chemicals that are involved in the vape and the cigarettes. So the patch gum and lozenges are pure nicotine, minus all the chemicals. And then we, it's a more controlled amount. We know the milligrams, so we can taper it down and help people that way. It, those deal, the patch gum and lozenges help alleviate all those withdrawal recovery symptoms. So they're not irritable and stuff like that. Yes. I know somebody that was, um given the patch and the person hallucinated, they could not tolerate it. Hmm. There, and it I haven't heard like that. They, Most they, of the things with the patch is um, skin irritation. Well, they did experience a hallucination and just, um, it affected their sleep. Yeah, it does affect the sleep on some people and then I recommend they take the patch off two hours before bed. Interesting. And then you put it on in the morning. Interesting. And if people do complain of nausea or anything with the patch, it's mostly because they're smoking with the patch on, so they're getting double the nicotine. So I, I do, when I do investigate more, I find out the misuse of a lot of the medications, so then they get frustrated and then they just give up. So that's why I try to edu I educate the youth on the meds out there too. So I, I am always pushing them towards parents 
or any, I said, do you have any, if not a parent, do you have a trusted adult that you know that you can speak to about this? So it's all about communicating. Anything? Go ahead. You look like you have a question. Do, right? The lips are pursing up. <laughs> What's the possible reason for all those additives? 7,000 additives. To make it uh, taste good. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> it's all the bottom line is to get Americans to smoke more, to vape more, what whatever they can do. When people vape in the house and they have children around and like they're all breathing in yes. all this nicotine yes. that they don't even know they're breathing in. Nope. And people feel that it's safer to vape so because of So if the young ones are starting right? to have asthma problems, that's sure. something the doctor would ask sure. about. It affects pets. There's something yeah. called third hand smoking. Um, so if you smoke a lot or vape a lot, it's in your clothing, it's on your couch, it's on your rugs. Mm -hmm. You have a toddler crawling and it puts its face in the, in the carpet, it can inhale some of the particles or the chemicals. So there's second hand and third hand. So a lot of the um, pediatricians are starting to ask parents about smoking with kids in the cars too. So. Mm -hmm. It's because my parents did smoke so much when I was younger that none of us kids in the family smoked. Right. Well, you can ask your doctor if you're concerned. Um, I tell my smokers all the time and the vapors, there is a low-dose lung scan. Um, if you ask your doctor about that, you can have a lung scan and it can prevent any future lung cancer down the road. There, they have, like, of course, a Rubik's to go through, you know, and check to see you know, how many packs a day they go by, so they'll ask how much you smoke or vape, and they'll times, you know, and if you're around parents that smoked how many years, how much did they smoke, so that may all add into it. But there is a low-dose lung scan out there for folks. All right. And November is Lung Health Month, so that was a good time to quit. <laughs> Great American Smokeouts in November. <laughs> um, any other questions? I'll leave my card with Mark too, so you can always have my information here. I have my brochures too, um, anything like that. Yeah, like okay, thank you, Michelle. Thank you for having me.